follow my father's to follow my father's uh, footsteps in uh, World War II. Just to give you a little bit of background on my father, he uh, he grew up in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania, in a coal miner's home. His father died when he was six uh, during some of the late stages of the uh, flu pandemic of that era. So he lived in a, a coal company home with his, his mother and uh, his four siblings. And uh, he was in the first in the family to go off to college. And he graduated from Westchester State College in Pennsylvania in education in uh, 1942 in June. And soon after he graduated from college, he received his draft notice for World War II. And as uh, you may recall, the war had been going on in Europe since 1939, and France had uh, surrendered in June of 1940 after 30 days uh, of uh, the Blitzkrieg by the Germans. So the war was not going well for the Americans at the time. And so my father got his draft notice. He went uh, to boot camp in October. And soon after boot camp, because at the time he was actually one of the few college graduates, given the large numbers of people they were trying to bring into the military. So they moved him over to officer uh, candidate school and training. And he became a second lieutenant. And then shortly after that, a first lieutenant. And he spent about two years of uh, training uh, officers to train their enlisted men on infantry tactics. So they used his education background to help uh, uh, train others. And he, uh, he spent a lot of time on that and a lot of time developing the curriculum at several of these bases. And he moved from base to base around the country to help train the officers at those bases for, uh, for helping the officers. A lot of it was basic stuff like map reading and just reading and writing, understand some basic French if that's where they were going to go. But how do you teach uh, others to learn what they need to know? And that was what he did. The, um, World War II, uh, when he uh, was finally sent over, uh, he was put on a ship in April of 1944 to go to England uh, for the invasion. And he, in getting to England, you know, he didn't know quite where he was going to uh, end up. They didn't know at the time what was being planned for the invasion of Normandy. So it was all a secret until he went over in June. But as much as it was a secret to him then, uh, we all know a lot now, but a lot of it was a mystery to me as to where he was during the war. I knew certain things that he would talk about. He would talk about Omaha Beach. He would talk about the Bocage, the hedgerows. He would talk about St. Malo, the breakout, uh, the Lure Valley, Luxembourg, uh, the Ruhr River, the Rhine River, the Elbe River. So those were kind of one word phrases that meant a lot to him. And uh, I remember those probably from first and second grade. So that was my starting point. I knew he was in the 331st Regiment, but I wasn't quite sure what division that was even in. You know, you'll hear these things, and I have done a lot of reading of World War II over the years, but I would kind of skip over all these uh, uh, discussions about the various uh, armies and army groups and battalions and regiments and divisions. So when planning this trip, I first had to educate myself on the hierarchy of uh, how the military works. And just as a quick rundown, at the top of the hierarchy, you have army groups, then you have armies, and then you have corps, then you have uh, divisions, regiments, battalions, uh, companies, uh, platoons, and squads. So you need to all understand that if you want to figure out where the person you're looking for was every day of the war. So then I figured out, okay, he was in the 331st, 83rd Division, and the army he was in uh, frequently changed. He was in four different armies during the period of time because they would move certain uh, divisions between armies as, uh, uh, as needs required. So I'm wondering, how do I find out where he was every night of the war? Because that was my goal. I wanted to follow his exact footsteps. I wanted to know where he was every night of the war from June 1944 until the war ended in May of 1945. So I'm just going online, Googling, and just looking for things like, okay, archives for 83rd Division, archives for the 331st Regiment. And I came across these things I had never heard about called morning reports. 
And there's a morning report for every company in every regiment, in every division. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, I have these hundreds and hundreds of morning reports from different companies, divisions. What do I open? I'm thinking, well, I knew he was, uh, when he went into combat for the first time, a lieutenant, and that he reported to his colonel, that he was on regimental staff. So I figured out when I saw a morning report for HQ Company 331, maybe I can find out where he was every day by looking at where their headquarters was. And if I knew where his headquarters was, he would be with his colonel, so I knew where he was every night of the war. And so I just randomly picked a, uh, a morning report from February 20th, 1945, where if you look at the report in front of you at the top, it says morning report, February 20th, uh, you know, 45, he was in Bernou, Belgium, uh, and it says no change. And I learned later in looking at these, no change meant that they were at the same place they were the day before or the day before that. But when they do make a change, they even put down the compass points as to exactly where the headquarters was. And the headquarters is fluid because the headquarters is in the front line with, with the men. They're in the same place and they're constantly moving. World War II was a, was a war of movement mostly. But what shocked me was, as you can see, when I... When I opened this morning report, his name was there. And so here I am trying to follow his footsteps and I see this report with his name on it. So there he was helping guide me in this trip to follow him. And it, it just really uh, threw me for a loop. And so what I figured out was that he would prepare these morning reports for his colonel. And the important thing in a morning report really was to one, indicate where they were, but also describe what personnel is not available, what personnel is missing. And his signature is at the bottom of the morning report. And so there it was on the very day of the war. So I would look at the morning reports for every day from June until uh, uh, May 1945 to see where he was. And I came up with a long list. Here is my list. It's kind of, you can see, just day to day, I've got many of these pages showing where he was. So then I mapped it out on maps of France, Germany, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, and Germany. And then I measured the distance between each headquarters. And then I figured out, okay, I basically got about three or four weeks to do this trip. I need to know where I want to be each day, where I'm going to stop, and where I'm going to spend the night. So I would measure out, okay, I figure this is going to, we want to do two days in this area, one day in this area. So I would work out uh, along the route he is, where would be a good place to stop where, where he had a headquarters, and then I would make a, a room reservation. So before we left, we knew exactly where we are going to be every day of the trip, uh, where we are going to spend every night. You know, we rented a car uh, and traveled from the uh, from after landing in Paris on a plane, uh, we, we stayed there a few days. And then we rented a, we took the train ride up to Cannes, which is in Normandy, and there rented a car. And we rented that for the entire trip. And so I had these roadmaps, I had it plotted out. I knew exactly where I wanted to go. And I had, I also read these things called after action reports. And the after action reports tell you what they had done that day in combat, what the, what the movement had been and what the, and what the battles were. So you gather a lot of information. So I had a lot of information. And of course, I started out on Omaha Beach. And as you can see there, that's the memorial on Omaha Beach in honor of those who landed there and served there. And uh, the other picture is the Nazi defenses. That's the bird's eye view of the, uh, of the German fortifications in shooting at uh, the Americans coming uh, ashore. Now, my father didn't arrive until D-Day plus 12. He was part of the reserves for the army for the invasion of Normandy. But when, when they uh, took off from England and they were about a thousand yards offshore, a huge storm hit and they were kept offshore for four days. And during those four days, they had put up these mulberry bridges and they were, they were an artificial port and they were a tremendous uh, advantage to load unload ships right on the beach of Normandy. But during those four days, all the mulberry ports 
were beaten up and no longer usable by the storm. They became unmoored from the grounds. So they landed in a landing craft. And when he landed on the, uh, the beach in Normandy, the, it, it was just a mess. There were burned out tanks, uh, burned out equipment, bodies being moved off the beach still. Uh, they were recovering the bodies and moving them in other boats to take, take away to boats and then back to England. But it was a brutal combat scene that uh, he saw that he was getting into. And that much progress had been made. By the day he arrived a week or so later after the invasion, they had only made uh, a few miles progress. Uh, they had not uh, accomplished what they had hoped to accomplish at that time. But they did get off the beaches and, and they were moving forward. And here you see again a few pictures of these are the pathways they walked up as, uh, away from Omaha Beach to move to their position of where they needed to be to join the to join the fighting where the fighting was taking place. You know, Omaha Beach is a pretty place. Um, holiday had ended when, uh, was just ending as we arrived in 2019, but kids were playing on the beach uh, at a major point where there was a strong pillbox for the Germans is now an, uh, a, a refreshment stand. So we were eating hot dogs and drinking Pepsis on the beach uh, where, you know, 75 years before, uh, the Nazis had been firing on, on the men landing. Here, of course, is the memorial uh, recognizing those who died in service uh, at Normandy and all the, all the beaches. And also you could be buried there uh, even if you were killed in other places throughout the European theater. So it's a solemn place, it's beautiful. It's looking down right on the beaches. Uh, the memorial on the left is kind of symbolic of a soldier helping another soldier, even as he's under fire uh, from machine guns as he's landing. Now, if you take a look at this map, this is the trail my father uh, and his regiment followed. And so they landed, uh, of course, at Omaha Beach. And if you see where, I just want to point out a few things because I'll be talking about them. As you see where Sherberg is, that's known as the Sherberg Peninsula or the Cotentin Peninsula. It's, they're kind of both used. And then if you look over where you see St. Malo, that's the Brittany Peninsula. And then down to Nans and across to Orleans, that's the Lure Valley and on the Lure River. And then over to Luxembourg and then up to Belgium and then up through Germany and across Germany to Berlin. So that red line is the pathway that my father's regiment followed. He was there uh, from the first day uh, of the 83rd landing to the end of the war. And when they came off the beach, they moved up the, uh, what were known as draws. They were the pathways to the village above. And as you can see where uh, this one picture was hanging in the town when Lee and I visited, it was the 75th anniversary of the invasion that year. And if you see the, the, the broken down building, that's a church. And the church you're looking at is actually the church in the background that's now been rebuilt. These towns were really, uh, terribly beaten down by uh, the, the US and the British uh, airplane uh, bombing and the artillery. Uh, hundreds of thousands of buildings were destroyed throughout France during the combat. Tens of thousands of civilians were killed. You know, it was the uh, unfortunate uh, casualty of war that uh, innocent victims and their way of life was knocked out by the bombing, whether from planes or the artillery. But you can see they rebuild. Normandy looks very much like this. It's just the prettiest of places, very small towns, uh, some beautiful old uh, you know, French architecture. And it was, a, it was a very pleasant place to be when we were there. But obviously, it wasn't so pleasant at the time. My father walked down this, this very road. So here's something I just want to read because it, it, it's significant because of all the war records I read on the 331st, this was the most descriptive of how hard it was. Because when my father came off the beach, they moved over to the Cotentin Peninsula uh, toward uh, uh, what is known as Coutance and uh, other uh, small towns on the, on the peninsula where the 101st Airborne had landed behind the beaches to try to, so, to keep the Nazis from being able to uh, attack 
for, uh, and reinforce on, on D-Day. So they weren't far from the beaches, but they were there to uh, offer some security for those landing on the beaches. But here's the 331st record. We moved over terrain broken by hedgerows and determined resistance. They were dug into earthen walls that marked each hedge. Enemy artillery zeroed in on us along with machine gun crossfire. They had connecting trenches between hedgerows that gave them escape routes. We were new troops from schools, offices, farms, and factories in the USA, pitted against Germany's best panzer grenadier divisions. We had never imagined a battle like this. We never expected to be walled in with the enemy in constant deadlock struggles. It was absolutely brutal. My father, again, the, I think I learned the term hedgerow before I could say mama or dada. It was just so overwhelming to these troops and of all things they weren't trained for. The intelligence knew there were hedgerows, but they did nothing with the intelligence. There were tactics were not developed. They were not trained for. What they had to do when they were fighting on the hedgerows, they were checkered boards and you couldn't move between squares. They had to move and some of these checkered boards were 50 yards, 60 yards apart. So they had to move from one hedgerow to the other. And if they moved across empty fields, they were killed instantly. If they moved along the hedgerows, they would be you know, sh uh, shot at also uh, with machine gun fire. Artillery fire, mortar fire was hitting them everywhere. And it was just a brutal going and they weren't going everywhere, anywhere. They might move 40 yards one day, uh, lose 50 yards the next day. They were trapped. And if you look at this, the morning report, again, the report I showed you in the first instance for July 20th, 1944, one day's report, 240 killed, 1,875 missing. A regiment contains about 3,000 men. In this one day, they basically had wiped out over two thirds of my father's regiment. And uh, that's how it was. And they had made no ground. They had made no advance. And all they were doing was getting killed and learning how to survive, learning how to fight, learning how to use the uh, uh, machinery they had to fight back. And they had to do it you know, uh, on the run. During those 20 days of July, from July 1st to July 20th, my father lost his three commanding colonels. They were all killed, one by a sniper fire and uh, others by artillery uh, fire. Uh, so he was on his fourth commander within four weeks of, uh, of fighting on Normandy. Just to say that his regiment had a 170% replacement rate. That meant that for every man there, another 1.7 men came in to replace him. He was one of the very few to survive from the landing all the way to Berlin. It was that brutal. There were replacements all along the way, because as you'll see, they basically fought in every major battle in Europe. And the environment they fought in here with the hedgerows, they were unprepared for, but as any good infantry, they adjusted. My father's job at the time was as a liaison officer was to run up and down the line between division headquarters and regimental headquarters and report position movements, take orders and organize you know, the, the day of battle uh, and what the command structure was. So he was always, uh, uh, in a jeep or, uh, you know, hiding, walking down rows and under constant mortar fire as they're moving around uh, throughout the war. Now, the efforts of the 331st and the 83rd Regiment and the others, again, the, the division, my father's division was one of many, many divisions. He was a small part of the war, but he was in the middle of it and his experience and his surviving it was uh, was unusual. Uh, these are just memorials that were put up to my father's regiment and to the division. Uh, the one on the left is St. Lo, which is uh, important because that's where what was called the breakout took place. This other one here in the, in the center is in Coutance. It's interesting because it kind of shows uh, in how the ground looked after uh, both American and Nazi 
uh, uh, artillery was fired on the community. So they, they turned it into a monument. And the other one, uh, the rock we saw is in a pretty town called Narshu, where my father's camp was really right behind that monument and in honor of the sacrifices of the 331st. Oops, let me go back here. Now, Coutance, uh, uh, this was the breakout. And my father also, in talking about uh, hedgerows, would talk about the breakout. He'd say, not until the breakout, not until the breakout. You know, he'd brush his teeth every day, but, but and they'd pound their fists against the ground as they were under mortar fire, waiting for a moment to move from one foxhole to another. He said, we didn't get any relief until the breakout. And the breakout didn't come until July 25th, 1944. And at the time of the breakout, they had only moved 14 miles into France. They had a million men plus. And the battle at that time was, could the Americans get more men on supplies quicker than the Nazis could bring men and equipment forward for a counterattack? So they need to move to make sure, they're not going into defensive lines because they need to move to make sure that counterattack can't build up force to wipe the Americans who are on uh, the continent off the, off the continent. So the breakout was a huge, huge event. And as you see, again, all over uh, France that year and uh, the other countries we traveled in, you, they were exhibiting pictures of what it was at the time of combat. And of course, you can see the middle screen, what the town looked like. And there's the church uh, my father uh, attended. He had a command post there for, uh, up near the church for a while. And I'm in front of the, the church that same day. But uh, the destruction was just, uh, was just terrible. And after the breakout, uh, my father's uh, division uh, and his regiment moved down uh, from uh, St. Lo, uh, making, uh, moving quickly and he then became part of Patton's Third Army. The Third Army joined combat on the continent. Patton wasn't involved until this point. Everybody knows about General Patton, but he was actually sitting in Calais, uh, France, uh, uh, across from Calais in England, because the Nazis were sure that wherever Patton was, that's, Patton was, that's where the invasion would come from. So they had huge fortifications in Calais, France, and Patton was across the water in England. He was there as a decoy. Uh, Eisenhower wasn't all that happy with him anyways, other than his brilliance as a commander, he was uh, pretty difficult to, to work with at times. But uh, he then came over uh, to the continent, uh, formed the Third Army and my father's regiment. And because of the breakout, they changed plans. They had planned to go uh, take care of the Brittany Peninsula, if you remember the map, you know, branches out uh, as they're coming down uh, uh, to their west. But instead, they're making such movement across France. My father's uh, regiment and uh, some other regiments were sent just to secure uh, major uh, port cities in, uh, in to take major port cities in the Brittany Peninsula. So it became a lesser assignment, but a brutal one because of the defenses that were there and the smaller number of men that were sent. So my father went up to uh, uh, went out to Brittany and his group and went up to St. Mal, uh, Denard and Lanier, and they were port towns. And the hope was they could take those port towns and use those ports for landing more men and supplies. As it turned out, <coughs> the, <coughs> the ports had been so destroyed defensively by the Germans, the ports were never used uh, during the war to resupply Americans as they were crossing Europe. So uh, they nonetheless, they moved from this hedgerow fighting where they had no tactics to St. Malo in these towns. And what they're doing is fighting, you know, street to street, house to house, taking over these towns where the, the Germans were dug in. And it was brutal fighting. And uh, they also, when they finally were able to overcome the defenses in the streets, there was a place called the Citadel. If you look at the fortification kind of on the beach in the one picture, uh, that was heavily fortified. And it was only by a lucky uh, shot from artillery went into a very narrow opening and started fires inside because it hit near the munitions inside the Citadel. They surrendered, so the Citadel surrendered. So in, instead of having to have this long uh, drawn out fight with the Citadel, the last holdout in St. Malo, uh, St. Malo, they were able to, uh, to get it done uh, more quickly. Now the woman uh, on uh, my wife's, that's my wife on the left and the white uh, blouse and uh, a woman we met on the right in Denard, 
she was curious about us because the holiday was over and we we're walking around taking pictures and she introduced herself. She's actually my age and she uh, lived in uh, uh, St. Malo and grew up there. And her memory was, you know, she wasn't there when the war was taking place, but her memory during her, you know, her first 10 years of life was of all the destruction. Most of the town of St. Malo was blown away. And you can see the old community, which is beautiful and walled, and then the community, part of the community that was destroyed. It's very modern and not as nice. And she remembers as teenagers uh, spending nights in the block houses, which were German fortifications, having parties with wine and beer with her friends, there were 500 block houses along the coastline. They were defending against you know, the US coming as an invasion force. It never happened, of course, they came from the rear and they landed, the Americans landed in Normandy. But she was interesting to talk about too because she lived it. She said that when they would rebuild buildings, they would, they would mark the rock, an, an architect or an engineer would mark the rock for where it needed to be placed, meaning was it a foundation rock? Was it a wall rock? Was it a ceiling rock? So they, they organized it all like a puzzle and use whatever they could to put buildings back together in the old town of St. Malo. And so they were able to salvage a fair amount. But as you see on the one picture, the Cafe de France, it's just a beautiful place now just to walk around. And, and it was a beautiful town before the war, but the war destroyed it, but it was rebuilt, a good part of it. And so St. Malo, of course, <coughs> some more pictures, another picture of the Citadel with the flag waving. Uh, you can see the destruction. You can see the Nazi pillboxes in some of these pictures with graffiti on them, the destroyed. And we walk through those. From the one point of destruction where the, a lot of Americans were killed, there's a beach. And you can see in the one picture a beach uh, down by the ocean. And I went swimming there. So I was able to enjoy what my father was not able to enjoy. My father was so enthralled with St. Mallow, the name stuck with him. And he wanted to name me Mallow rather than Martin but my mother wouldn't let him. She didn't want a boy named Mallow Mac. So instead uh, I got a Martin instead. So, uh, but he always told me I wanted to name you Mallow. Didn't happen. Now this Dalda Branton, uh, as they're moving off the Brittany Peninsula and moving south in France and Patton is surging west, heading toward Paris and uh, uh, all the Americans moving very rapidly. Uh, my father's regiment start, stopped in this one beautiful little town and the, what the monument tells you is that two uh, low ranking members of my father's regiment went to meet the priest in the church. You see a picture of the inside of the church and asked him if they would introduce the two soldiers to the commander of the German uh, uh, troops in uh, Dota, Britain. And he did. So these two young soldiers, low rank, met with the commander and the two soldiers convinced uh, the commander to abandon the town so this 12th century church wouldn't be destroyed that everyone else was now retreating west, you know, to, uh, to the Western Wall defenses of Germany beyond the Seine. And this commander did one decent thing in an otherwise indecent war. He withdrew and the Americans moved in and uh, the town was not destroyed like most of the others were. And uh, these two brave young guys, you know, met with the commander. It was one more again sign that American troops, American infantry doing what they needed to do to adjust to any given moment. Uh, this small town uh, is outside of Nantes, uh, France. You head down from the Continent Peninsula, you come off of Brittany, head south, and uh, it's right on the edge of the Loire Valley, which is where my father's troops headed, uh, headed west to cover the Patton's flank on his right. And I happened to be in Herrick, and we stayed there, and I planned it this way, but I happened to be in Herrick the very same uh, date is my father had a command post there, you know, 75 years later. And these roads that I show and these signs were the very roads that they marched down. And we stayed in this little restaurant. It was really pretty nice. It was small, uh, but they had the fanciest restaurant, I think Lee and I saw when we were over there. And it was, it was really a great place to stay. But uh, I walked around in the morning and the green lands that surround there. And uh, now you can see uh, because these, because of these, uh, uh, points on the morning reports, give compass reports, give compass points, they've all now been uh, recorded. So you can click on a map to see exactly where in the field one's uh, family member or a troop was. So I know now that my father was, I knew it was Herrick, but I learned later it was right on these grounds that you can see in the, in the background, which they use as a command post. But again, the command posts are just part of the regiment. They're, they're all the tents in the, the 
foxholes or whatever. Once in a while, they get a little better quarters, but it's pretty much just uh, one other company mixed with every other company. Uh, so now they're down on, on your far left. Th th that is in Nans. That's a castle there and a uh, beautiful pl uh, place. Nans was, was really destroyed terribly. It's, it's a nice city, but it, it, it doesn't have the historic residents that most of Europe has because it was so destroyed. It was an important port town, you know, with the river coming up to it from the south. And it was, it was really destroyed terribly. Uh, but when they got down to Nans and then they were finished protecting uh, Patton's flank, they headed west. They headed east, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and they traveled 245 miles in a single day. If you think back, back into June and July when they're moving a yard at a time and not, not, not even making that, here finally because of the breakout and basically the collapse of the German lines running west, running east to get back to their lines, they were able to move very quickly. And my father's camp that night after leaving uh, Herrick and the Nans area was in Montargui. And Montargui was not touched by the war because the movement had happened so quickly that there was no need to uh, shower with artillery or bombing before the troops got there because uh, the Nazis just packed up and left trying to retreat to a defensive line in Germany. So its beauty remained, and uh, we spent a night there, just a great little town, uh, pleasant to see, and the people were spared uh, some of the brutality that some other communities were spared. And because it had no important you know, manufacturing value, uh, that it was not bombed, because the United States, of course, was bombing Europe for years before the invasion. But fortunately, this town was spared because it was of no strategic value. So my father's then next trip was to to Luxembourg. They, they cross France in two days. Uh, Luxembourg is a, uh, is a country that has now about only about 600,000 people. And uh, Luxembourg was quickly captured by Germany at the beginning of the war in 1940. And Germany actually annexed Luxembourg. And my father loved, fell in love with Luxembourg. They spent some time there. They had a little break. There was combat, but he also had a little bit of a break there, the regiment after all the fighting they had been going through. And we have uh, uh, tourist books from the time. I've got one right in my room here near me that my father had, and he met. And when he was there, he met this couple. And at the time, uh, they were all impoverished. Uh, the French speakers were not allowed to speak French. There was a Nazification campaign to make sure that they became as German as the uh, Germany they were annexed to. And this couple was Catholic, which again, were discriminated against by the Germans. That he met and uh, they had a little girl who was older than the usual age for her first communion if you're catholic you know catholics are first reserved first communion around first grade so this little girl uh, now that the americans had arrived the church was going to schedule a first communion it was the first one in many years and so my father wrote home to his sister regina in wilkesboro pennsylvania and asked if she could send a first communion dress so my aunt uh, shopped and sent over this first communion dress that you can see in the picture that this little girl is wearing. She would not have had a dress otherwise available. And uh, uh, I'm sure some kids didn't uh, have the good fortune of having someone who could get them a dress. But my father helped out in this case. And uh, it, uh, it was a moment he stayed in touch for years with this family. And at some point, as time happens, uh, my father died when I was 22 and he was only 57. And we just lost touch uh, with the family over time. But that little girl now would, what, she looks about eight or nine years old. So it would be in her, if she's living in her mid to late 80s. Uh, and, but we've just never been able to reach her. But Luxembourg was a respite, but there was also battles going on in, in Luxembourg. And uh, as you'll see here, this is a town called Wormelgang. And uh, in the one picture, you see these beautiful vineyards uh, as they slope downhill to the to the Moselle River, which on the other side is Germany. And so it was important to take this town, you'll see at the time that uh, when the attack was undergoing, almost from the same point where we took our picture, the smoke rising from the homes, the, the routine would be is that there would be shelling and uh, then the troops would come in, there'd be mortar fire, artillery fire, and then the American troops would go in and basically move house to house and street to street. And they took the town. 
it was important because there was a small, uh, there was an important kind of landing there and a train center that came into town. So, and the Germans would come in at night and reinforce the troops that were in town, but they were able to take it. And uh, it was an important, basically, uh, accomplishment to protect the, uh, the, on the east side of the major city of Luxembourg. So a small battle, but one of many, you know, the war is, any war is filled with small battles and small movements and each individual soldier's role is important and critical to the overall whole of the effort. And uh, that's what being a soldier is in the army and being in the infantry is you, you care only about those around you and you wanna survive the war and you do your duty. And it's, uh, it's what happened time and time again all across Europe. And here's a little interesting story. So the, it, uh, my father mentioned this place they got to stay at for a little while in Luxembourg. You know, they're mostly sleeping in the woods or in the foxholes or in hedgerows. And they commandeered Senegan Castle, you know, which was property of the Grand Duke of Luxembourg. The way Luxembourg works is the Grand Duke is actually the chief of state, and then they have a prime minister. So he's the highest ranking official in Luxembourg then and is now. And if the picture on, uh, on uh, the one side of the uh, color photo is the picture today. And on the right is the pictures when my father was staying there. Now that's an anti-aircraft gun, but they actually didn't use, they used them for anti-aircraft, but the, the, you know, the, the, the German Air, uh, Air Force was, was not uh, a real factor uh, at this point in the war. They did have some planes at times and they would marshal them to use in critical situations. But these anti-aircraft guns became very important weapons for, for ground use against tanks, armored vehicles, and infantry. Uh, they were, a, it was a powerful weapon to use. And again, the, the uh, infantry figured out how to use an anti-aircraft gun in its most effective way. But when Lee and I showed up, we were looking for this place and we couldn't see it from the road and Luxembourg is all on a hillside. So you're winding up and down these, uh, these roads that you look like you're gonna fall into the Grand Canyon as you're going down them. And so we've kind of figured it's gotta be there. So we parked and I started walking around through some trees and bushes and came to this security fence. And I'm thinking, well, that's strange. And all of a sudden a guy, you know, in a civilian dress, but very officious came up to me and said, can I help you? And I said, well, I'm trying to get into the building. He goes, uh, I'm sorry, it's not allowed. It's, uh, it's, it's the arch, uh, uh, the Grand Duke's property and we hold uh, our events here. And I then told him my story and he said, well, come with me. So I went with him and he took me down onto the grounds and walked around the property and showed me around. And I showed him my pictures that I, I had that you're seeing. And uh, it was just uh, great to have a chance to get onto the property and to, uh, again, see the site that, uh, that my father had talked about. And also, if you read the 331st history, they talk about their days and time at, uh, at this headquarters, how, in, how important it was. So uh, let me get back here. I hope I've lost my arrow here. Where did I put it? There I go. So there we are there. So then after uh, Luxembourg, you know, the, the hard thing about a place like Luxembourg, when you feel a little bit normal, and you're connecting with life again, you know, ordering a first communion dress. And then the order comes to move on. Uh, it was nice to, nice to have the respite, but it has to be even harder to go back into the, you know, the smoldering hell of combat. And where they went next into the Hurchin Forest was as brutal a battle as they had fought any time in the war. You'll see in these pictures, Gay is a town that is right outside uh, the forest. The forest is only 55 square miles. And Gay is a town where all the roads converge going into the forest. The one picture is my father's foxhole. You know, that's the command headquarters. So we went from Senegan Castle to this place as his headquarters. And the Hurton Forest was just brutal. Tree bursts as the art mortar fire would come in and artillery fire would come in, hitting the top of the trees it would create shrapnel from the wood in the trees. So the, 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 tr the wood of the trees became a weapon and just killed and wounded many, many men. And they're there, where the, the Hurchin Forest is, it's, you go through uh, the uh, westernmost part of Germany, south of Aachen, Germany, and you head toward the Ruhr River, and then there's the Hurchin Forest in Germany. The Hurchin Forest was just one more, huge mistake of World War II. 
totally unnecessary to be sending troops to the Hurchin Forest. Men had been there already for a month when my father got there. It's a 55 mile square area on a 500 mile front where the United States and the British and the Canadians are pushing against Germany, you know, heading toward Berlin. And to choose to this forest as an avenue and a pathway forward has been criticized time and time again since the war because it took away all the advantages the US Army had, which was air cover, tanks, mobility, artillery. They couldn't move this through the forest. So they're in ground fighting like in World War I and the Germans had prepared part of their west wall in the forest and were ready for the Americans. And it, it just killed so many men and wounded so many others uh, that it was, it was not worth the effort. Now, Gay was taken and Duren was taken, two important communities on the west side of the Ruhr River. Uh, and they were taken. And the plan was to then to cross the Ruhr along, you know, along a long front. But they weren't able to uh, do that because they got a call. They got a call to move out of the Hurchin Forest and join the Battle of the Bulge. And on Christmas Day, 1944, these are my father's uh, men in the black and white picture, are moving from the hell of uh, the Hurchin Forest to go back to where they had already been on land that had already been taken and to communities that had already been saved and do it all over again. And so in brutal cold and snow, it was so cold, it was one of the coldest winters in decades. The blood plasma that they used to save lives was frozen. And it was just, you can see here in the pictures, the landscape that Lee and I saw on a relatively pleasant day. It rained a little bit. One of the few days of rain we had in all the weeks we were there. But nonetheless, uh, it was a beautiful landscape. Remind me a lot of central New York. I felt very much at home uh, as we got into Belgium and where a lot of the Battle of the Bulge was fought. Very pretty. It's in Belgium, as uh, you may know. And uh, they moved very quickly. And the Battle of the Bulge is named the Battle of the Bulge because the line went basically from the, you know, from the North Sea down to Switzerland. It was a, basically a straight line, weaved a little bit here and there that the Americans held in pushing their way into Germany. And the Bulge was where on an, about an 80 mile front, the Germans pushed across that line and created a bulge. And it kind of peaked like a pyramid. And so when my father and his men and other divisions came down from where they had been in the Hurchin Forest, they were pushing against the north flank of the bulge. And their job was to keep pushing that north flank while other armies were pushing against the point in the south flank to push the Germans back into Germany. And they did that and it took weeks to do. And uh, it was the most, uh, it was the biggest battle fought in Europe by the Americans in World War II. So after all this, after all these men had gone through, they st still had to endure this great battle of all time. The one memorial is in uh, Bastogne. Many of you probably know the term Bastogne because that was a centerpiece. It showed in the movie Patton of where the combat was taking place and holding ground to keep the Germans from advancing. The German plan was to break through, go up to Antwerp, uh, envelop the Americans that were already uh, the British, the Canadian, the Americans take over the port. It was it was futile. It was uh, it was something a sane commander would not have ordered. Uh, but Hitler was uh, was not was not sane at that point. He was dreaming dreams that were unrealistic, and he was determined to take everybody in Germany down with him to the grave because he gave ever gave any thought to surrender. But it was a sad place because of. Uh, all the markings of the war that they thought had been over and, uh, and they thought they had been freed. But uh, a lot of small museums we visited too. The one thing you find in Europe if you're taking a trip like this, there's a lot of private museums and these people dedicate their lives and they make a little bit of money, kind of like an historical society, truthfully, but they're privately owned. Small exhibits, very uh, well done. People work hard at these things. You pay maybe five or 10 you know, euros to get in and uh, they're not making a lot of money on them. But if you ever uh, travel through Europe and ever uh, see these small private museums, they're actually worth seeing. Uh, they're, they're, they're very honest about what they have and what they don't have. 
and uh, it was well worth the effort. And you got a sense of the local community too in talking with them. You know, we don't, I don't speak French and Lee doesn't speak French or German. We had little trouble traveling across the continent and driving our own car, traveling, you know, following our maps, doing whatever we wanted to do. Very little trouble not speaking the language. We learned a few words, of course, thank you, please, and a couple of things. But uh, the Battle of the Bulge went on, huge casualties and uh, uh, a tremendous effort. After the Battle of the Bulge, uh, which went on really until uh, mid-January mid uh, to accomplish, Germany was worse off. As much harm as they had done and as many casualties as they had caused, uh, the fact that they came out into the open and exposed their troops, they came out from the defensive lines, allowed uh, the allies to destroy a huge amount of the remaining German uh, military. So it actually hastened the uh, end of the war. So Hitler not only failed in the strategy of by not succeeding, he made it worse by the, the death and destruction of so much of his army. So as brutal as it was, the war likely ended months early because of that. And for those like my father who had survived, increasingly they knew the war's end was ahead, whether it was a month, two months, or three months. And that probably made it all the harder, wondering if one was going to survive uh, the remaining time while so many others did not. What you're looking here is in Julich, Germany, it's part of the Western Wall. These fortifications you're looking at were built along uh, uh, the 500 mile front from the North Sea down to Switzerland. This is part of it in Julich where my father crossed the Ruhr. That's a picture of me crossing the Ruhr on a footbridge, obviously it wasn't there at the time, but it is right, the, the footbridge is, is about where my father crossed. The Ruhr is not like the Rhine, which we'll see in a minute. The Ruhr is a smaller river and uh, not as wide and not as uh, tough to cross. The currents and all aren't as, aren't as difficult. So Julich was a relatively easy crossing once they could cross. The battles, of course, leading up to, to the crossing were to take control of the communities on the west side of the river, which were, again, fighting you know, street to street, house to house, artillery, uh, and it was, it was just uh, fighting that they were used to, but clearly probably never got used to. But you see these fortifications, very interesting. They're still in relatively good shape. And at this particular point, there's a park. You don't see it in these pictures, <coughs> but a little beyond the other side of what you're looking at was a very pretty park, public park, uh, where they, uh, along the river. Uh, we didn't go into the park. and you know, we had so many places to go and so many stops to make, but we could see the park. But they've turned these fortifications into a place where uh, there's a playground there where kids can have a pleasant day and play. And uh, they certainly don't hide the war. When you're in Germany, they don't hide what they did. They don't hide the life they lived. They don't have a Donald Trump running the country where things never happen. Uh, they're very honest about it. So here we are crossing the Rhine in Wessel and Germany. Now, the Ruhr's only probably about four, the Rhine's only about 14 or 15 miles from the Ruhr in Germany. But it took some time uh, to get there. And uh, uh, as you can see in this picture, the bridges that were destroyed uh, on the way uh, after the Nazis moved to the other side, they destroyed their bridges. Across like everything Hitler did, he didn't follow the usual uh, military procedure. He put up his major defense on the west side of the Rhine, meaning on the side that you're seeing that is destroyed, which is never good defense because when you leave, you can't get all your troops over, you can't get all your equipment over, all your artillery, and that's exactly what happened. So instead of setting up a defense on the east side of the Rhine, he wanted to stop them on the west side of the Rhine to try to keep the river open. But it was futile, and in the end, it was fatal. And uh, this was a beautiful town. We spent a night in a, in a hotel right on the river, and we could dine looking out on the Rhine that night. So different than when my father crossed. I'm standing right where my father crossed the river uh, on, a, on a pontoon bridge. And now there's cows there. Again, I uh, told you a lot of this area reminded me of Central New York. Uh, but the Rhine is a tough river to cross. It's, it's wide and it's a very strong current. It's very deep. And the fortifications, uh, even after they were on the other side, uh, were very difficult to cross. But they did, they did cross. Again, up and down, the Rhine runs through Germany. This is just one point 
of a large, very long front. We're, we're, the Eisenhower strategy was to invade Germany at a lot of points so that their reduced resources through attrition is having to decide where to go. If you went in in one breakout point, if you put all your troops, then you got to worry about your flanks and you got to have a supply line that goes as deep as your line goes into the country. So Eisenhower's strategy really worked and ended the war uh, much more quickly than it would uh, by some other strategy. The race across Germany, uh, after they crossed the Rhine, they were moving miles and miles a day. These are just towns that we went through as we crossed Germany. That's Lee walking in Paderborn, uh, uh, looking up uh, in, the, in the jeans and the black jacket uh, on the far left. Now, where that space is, where you also see that fountain uh, with, the, you know, with the icon in the middle, that was all building space at the time of the invasion in the time before the bombing. But Paderborn was an important, very important city. It was an industrial city and they just destroyed it. And so that, and you see behind the, uh, the fountain, the kids and the people sitting out, we saw that in every town time and time again. The social and community life of these communities is first rate. After school, after work, people are drawn to the town centers and sit around and enjoy coffee or beer or wine. It's just a tremendous lifestyle. Uh, the, the lifestyle and the infrastructure of Europe uh, in many places uh, far surpassed the lifestyle and infrastructure uh, of this country. Uh, but all these towns, again, I, I won't, there's all little battles fought, more destruction, more death. Uh, like the sign in Pole, it was a brutal battle, lost a lot of men, this little community. And uh, they wrote in their uh, war notes that it was as bad a battle as they had the entire war, this little town. So here we are about to cross the Elbe on April 13th. They had moved 245, 55 miles in a couple of days again to get to this point. And Berlin, of course, is only about 50 or 60, 70 miles away. And the one picture is the remains of a building that was destroyed during the attack. And the 331st was the first across the Elbe. Of all the troops up and down the entire line across Germany and across the Rhine, they were the first to cross the Elbe and nothing then between them and, and Berlin. It's a beautiful setting. We were there on just a, a beautiful day, a pleasant September as one could imagine. And they crossed the Elbe on, a, uh, on uh, basically on boats. They came across and set up, a, you know, a, 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 invasion force there. And their, their job was basically to secure a perimeter for as many miles as they could go to allow uh, others to, to cross with them. But there was a surprise. If you look at that building with the car in front of it, that's actually our car rental. And the farm in this beautiful setting, that building was occupied by Nazi youth. And uh, those of mature fighting age were already off fighting, but there were hundreds of young men, probably 14, 15, 16 years old in a Hitler school, uh, training school there. And they should have left well enough alone. They had survived the war, but what they did and with their adult commanders set up a perimeter and the 331st was surprised because they didn't expect any resistance. They knew that there was a boys school of sorts there, but they were determined to die for Hitler. And that's what they did. Uh, about 400 young men were killed that day. The battle took 12 hours and uh, uh, they were young, inexperienced, but nonetheless deadly. Americans here thinking the war is almost over continued to suffer casualties. And it was just a brutal 12 hours and uh, there were no holds barred. They didn't fully realize who they were fighting in until it was over and saw all these young men, these young men, the bodies of young men that had been killed. Uh, I, I saw this one little uh, Zoom do uh, documentary that a gentleman had put on who had been there. And he said he just couldn't believe that they are all these young boys that they had killed, hundreds of them. But uh, th that's uh, uh, the Nazi uh, fanaticism and the Hitler's enabling it. So the last wartime headquarters my father had was here in Vedettes. And uh, it was an interesting place. Uh, it, was, it was a nice setting. 
this is where he last was. It was probably a week or two before Hitler killed himself on April 28th. And while the bullets were still flying, at least at the 331st, they were flying elsewhere. Uh, this is where he stayed at this Chateau Domaine de Bedets. It was the same then as it is now. We didn't see a soul. We walked around the building and then finally we saw kind of a blonde haired guy that we figured owned it. But we walked through into the, into the courtyard. And as you see the one sign there on the back of a carriage of sorts, it's advertising this place. It's a wedding venue now. And the interesting thing is that after the war, this was all part of uh, Russian controlled Eastern Europe. So this was part of the Soviet East Germany. And so all these folks came out of World War II and then lived under Soviet uh, dominion until 1989, 1990. So we would not have even had access to this with, uh, with ease had we come before 1989. But it was, it was a great day to be there. It was beautiful weather. It was, it was kind of hard to let my father go after traveling that distance. But uh, it was a great trip. And uh, there's obviously a lot more to know about uh, World War II. And this is just a, uh, a brief sliver of the effort. Uh, but we traveled all that way. Uh, to follow his, his footsteps, and the fact that he survived uh, was remarkable. If I learned nothing else, it was how brutal the war was. And as we read about what happened each place we were, we, I kept thinking, how did they go through this day in and day out? It, uh, it had to be difficult, and I'm sure they lived it every day of their lives. Uh, so that's it. I can answer a few questions if you'd like. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Is that okay? Sure. Um, I don't know about anybody else who's watching it, but after spending 45 years of my life studying history, I have to tell you, Marty, um, this has been one of the most enjoyable hours that I have spent. Um, it's reliving, you know, this part of history, the greatest generation. Um, I can certainly... Uh, uh, say like I feel like I was right there with him and the irony one more thing really quickly is when your dad was at Bedettes my birth father was on Okinawa exactly. so you've energized me to uh, do a little bit more digging myself so thank you so much well, let me uh, call me sometime I can tell you what records to go at it, it, it's it's getting easier every day to find out I would love it thank you also you, this is last photo that's my father in cold Germany the fighting was over. He looks a bit relaxed. And look at this one little uh, re warning report he wrote. He must have loved writing that. It says the company softball game, you know, who won the softball game? And he says, whether clear, warm, or how high. So it kind of, uh, I thought this was significant as to no change and that they're playing softball. And at the time, they were worried about having to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. The war didn't end there for uh, several more months. Mm -hmm. I also don't have a question, but a comment. It really, I, I second the comments that Christine made. Uh, it's wonderful to that, that you have sort of t taken us on this trip. I've spent a lot of time in Luxembourg. I particularly paid attention, yeah. <laughs> but I've also uh, spent a lot of time in Cologne, so south of where your father's division right. went through. But. Uh, I took my map out so I could follow you. <laughs> this is German map. <laughs> so I could follow, trying to figure it out, trying to visualize. A very good presentation. I really. Well, thanks. The, the, hard, the hard thing is, as you said, you took your map out. The ideal thing would kind of be to split the screen up with maps and show movement. But, you know, it's, you try to do something in 50 minutes and it's hard to, it helps to have a sense of geography. That's why I hope you, you could at least keep some of that first map in your, in your heads. Without a map, it gets kind of hard. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Marty. I think that this was a really wonderful presentation. Um, my dad was over there, went from Omaha Beach to Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. So his path was similar, but very different. And, you know, so it was, it was, I think, helpful for you to give us some information that sort of points us in the direction to find out where they were. I also have maps of Europe, but I haven't really like sat down and, and pinpointed everything. 
Um, but it would be an interesting trip, that's for sure. It would be, in fact, if, you're, if your father came in through Omaha Beach and not from the south of France in Marseille, then he was probably with Patton's Third Army. And when, when Patton's Third Army headed south towards where your father was, then my father's uh, uh, regiment and division moved to the Ninth Army. So from February, first for a while, they went with the First Army. And from like December right. to February, they were the First Army. They were with Patton until December. And then they went over to the Ninth Army. And so Patton did cover the South End around Czechoslovakia and stuff like that in the Third Army. So that's probably huge. Well, yeah, I am fortunate that one of the members of uh, the division or the regiment, um, probably actually his company, uh, wrote out a, a whole detailed thing and listed all the places that they were. So, you know, that's been very helpful. He was with the 803rd Military Police uh, Company. So, you know, he went along with these other regiments and, and went to the various places. So, you know, those military police were so critical, especially when they would take a town. One of the saddest stories was when my father's, the war was over and they were in a restaurant in Germany, a young Nazi youth came behind my father's friend and killed him. Oh. Uh, right there. Wow. Well, the thank you again, Marty. This has been great. Yeah. All right. If nothing else, I guess we're all set. If anybody, but if anybody has any interest in uh, kind of exploring, even from afar, even if it's not possible to make a trip where they are, uh, I, uh, let me know. I, I'll try to be of help in just connecting you with records and kind of a way to figure it out. Uh, and there are a lot of good web Facebook sites, actually, where people are more than willing to help. Uh, and I can kind of guide you to them, too. The technology is really uh, the, today created a, a, a great online record. So you can even, and again, you can even see the battlefields from home where your important person was because Google Maps will take you right there. Okay, Tabitha, I guess we can close it. Uh, yep. Thank you so much, Marty. It was a good time for everyone. Uh, very informative. And we are going to be having some other lunch and learns. Just stay tuned. We don't have them planned yet, but we're working on it. So we're just getting back to normal. So thank you all for coming today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye now.